I really hope that we're still inviting people to worship, that we're inviting them to Bible class, that we're sharing our church bulletins with our neighbors. This is the stuff that they need to hear. I hope that we're using our great influence and power. And you have the capacity to make or break someone's whole rest of the day. Now, we would like to make their day with the truth, but you have the knowledge that, and they're not mad at you. They're, they're upset with their tradition, and they're upset with the discomfort of not obeying the truth. Use your power. Now, this morning, we're, we're taking a different turn, and we're saying not the power of the messenger that you hold. We're talking about the absolute power of the Word. And we're going to go through several texts. We're going to make a transition. But this morning, what I'd like to start with do you know what just really irks me? Is when you're having Bible conversation with somebody, or I'm having Bible conversation with somebody, and they say, I put out an idea, and they say, I don't know about that. Well, what does that mean? Except you're admitting your own ignorance. If you really knew how to disagree with me and prove me wrong, you would say, I don't agree with that, and here's why. But a person who just says, well, I don't know about that. All they're admitting to everybody is, that's not what I currently believe, and I can't stand that. I try very hard not to be that way with people. When, I'm, when we're talking about the Bible and they put something out that maybe I don't have a right-away answer to, I'm not just going to shoot it down and say, well, I don't know about that. I'd just be admitting my ignorance on it. Look at this. If at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. Albert Einstein said that. If at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. Now, here's the thing. Members of the church who would say to their brothers or their sister when they're having Bible conversation, I don't know about that. Do you know what gets said to us when we go to these sectarian groups and we try to present them real Bible information? They, they get up, a Baptist preacher gets up, and he extends his plan of salvation. He invites everybody to come to the mourner's bench. And we say to them, we don't say, I don't know about that. We say, that's not what the Bible says. You didn't mention Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38. And you really didn't even mention repentance either. You just said, come to the mourner's bench. We give them solid reason why we disagree. Here's my point. When we treat each other that way just by telling brothers and sisters, well, I don't know about that, we're not behaving any better than a sectarian is. You don't just get to say, well, that's not what I already believe. And I don't know how to combat what you're saying right now, but I know that currently I don't agree with it. Well, who cares if I've got Scripture for it? It might sound absurd to you at first. I was studying, me and a friend, when we were in Tennessee, we were studying in a Baptist preacher's office, and I don't even know how we got here, but he brings up John 3, 5. And he, he seriously, y'all, he had been through seminary, and he had never considered this. And it's a shame that he lived in a town where there were multiple congregations of the Church of Christ, and he'd still never heard this. He said, what do y'all think John 3, 5, born again is? We both said, water baptism, born of water and the Spirit. And he said, I don't know about that. And then my friend said to him, what do you think it is? And he said, well, I know it's not that. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, we, none of us know what it is, because you've taken our idea and not replaced it. That the man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is not how God wants us to have Bible study. And just because it sounds strange to you on the front end doesn't mean that it's wrong. When we talk to people, and here's the thing, they are so entrenched in their traditions. Mark was talking to, he's got some new neighbors, and he said something about born in sin. They got little kids. Mark said, who would put your little kids in hell? And they said to Mark, well, that makes sense. Baptists teach it everywhere. Little kids born in sin, totally depraved, just little devils lying to each other in their cribs. And we come along and say, you know, the Bible says that baby's pure. Man, get out of here. I don't know about that. They don't have any scripture to make their cause, and we can give them a handful of scriptures throughout the Bible. People say, read the Bible, you'll find it. We can go throughout the Bible and do it. Just because it sounds different doesn't mean that it's wrong. People, I'm saying the bulletins you're getting... The one church, the exclusivity of the one church. Somebody says, and that's another thing, me and my friend talking to a guy on the porch. He said, you think that you guys, and he wasn't just talking about the two of us. He said, you think the church of Christ is the only church going to heaven. And we said, that's what the Bible says. And he stepped back and he said, you dudes are weird. That's not that weird, right? We're not like saying sacrifice your babies. We're saying do what the Bible says. Be a member of the church that's in the Bible and then you'll be okay with God. Now let's look at this. 
It might sound absurd, and here's the thing. Man, y'all, we get in here and we have these discussions with each other, and it just further solidifies people do not read their Bibles. Now, let's do this. Just like we said, sectarian people say to us, well, I don't know about that. And then brethren say to other brethren, I don't know about that. We're probably not reading the Bible as well as we ought to be. And here's what I'm saying. Look at these points. This is how people will do you in Bible discussion. Let's zoom in. Objective facts, what confirms your pre-existing beliefs, what you see. Does that make sense? You don't have a problem with facts. They don't have a problem with facts. Only while they confirm their belief patterns. People keep parroting Bible passages without getting, giving credit to the Bible. Albert Einstein says it might sound absurd. The idea is... If at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. Do you know that in and of itself is a Bible concept? And here it is. 1 Corinthians 1, 21 and 23. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. If it's not absurd, it has no hope. The foolishness of preaching to save uh, them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now, think about this. If the Jews don't like it and the Gentiles don't like it, who likes it? Doesn't sound like anybody goes for this. Stumbling block, that is from the Greek word scandalon. And when you say today's word scandal, that's what they said. This is, this is not good stuff. This looks bad. Y'all's leader was hung on a cross between two thieves. This is not something I want to get behind. And then this idea coming over to the Greeks, they just said it's foolishness. There, and it would be the idea of what? God took on flesh. He, take, he takes on flesh, y'all kill God. Now your sins are gone. They didn't believe it. It was foolishness to one crowd. It was a stumbling block to the other. And, and God says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. There's nothing wrong with this. People in the world, they think that Christianity is weird. <laughs> Look, y'all, we use it as an insult, but it's because he's one of the smartest people. They say, good job, Einstein. But are we not saying he's one of the smartest people that we think has ever lived? And he said, world-changing ideas sound weird on the front end. That's not a big deal. People think you're like, now, well, I don't know these people. Who used to come up to, and I'm not asking you for real. They'd come up to you in the airport, give you a flower. Weren't they called like Moonies or something like that? Jesus freaks. They had just all these type of things like that. I'm just a person who wants to make the community a better place. I want to love and appreciate and help my fellow man. What's so absurd about that? But that is the starting point. Now think about this. Years ago, y'all, we have progressed so far in the last 150 years. Somebody comes along and say, you know, ain't you tired of that buggy? You gotta get your horses ready, hit your horses up, feed your horses, wire your horses, and then they pull this buggy into town. What if I gave you a buggy that pulled itself? I don't know about that. What if I gave you a boat? You didn't actually have to row across the lake. It just boat just takes you across the lake. I don't know about that. We're gonna fly through the air. Go to Tennessee, from Tennessee to Virginia. I don't know about that. All this stuff that we now do that you know full well, people used to say, I don't know about that. Here it is in the Bible. I'm a Christian. That's good for you, man. Not for me. I am perfectly fine that the way that I live is absurd to a number of people inside this community. And you know what? They are going to be getting into all kinds of trouble that hope, hoping to God with His Word, I can avoid. So if you want to chalk that up to being absurd, that's fine. Now let's look at this. Luke 23, 46 and 47. He says, The Greeks... Did, they called it foolishness. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. The centurion, this is a Roman standing by, saying, Glorifying God, certainly this was a righteous man. So someone who looks at the Christian system and they say, Okay, God takes on flesh. God lives among y'all for three years. Y'all kill God, and now your sins are gone. Why did you have to let them, why did we have to let them paint it in that light? 
Why could we not say in seeing the Christian system, yes, God took on flesh. Why? So that He could feel us and empathize with us. Y'all ever heard of any of these, quote, deities who has that much concern for their creation? Number one, most of these deities didn't create us. They're just deities that somehow inhabit the universe alongside of us. He creates us and takes on flesh. Why? So that He can simply say, I know what it feels like. I understand what you're going through. And while he is living in the flesh saying, I know what it feels like and I know what you're going through, he says, let me extend myself to you and help you in some type of fashion. They say, well, God only inhabited with, with man for three years. And you know how much he did in that three years? Do you know how many lives he made better in three years? What are the sectarian groups doing for people today? Taking their money. What are these people who, like I'm saying, Joel Olstein got the biggest church in Houston, Texas. What's he doing for people? And I'm saying, y'all, People start talking trash about Christianity, give it back to them. What's Marxism doing for the communities? Nothing. What's anything that man is coming up with? And I'm saying even this too, y'all. Our overstepping government is not the way to change the world. Politics is not how you change this world. This is it. Surely this was a righteous man. I'm imperfect, but I'm trying to follow this righteous man. John 1.14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And here's the thing. You know, we read these texts. I don't know when the last time you read John is. But we read these texts and we look at these people and we see where this Scripture says they beheld His glory. You can behold His glory just as much as they did by reading your Bible. Because I am telling you, He didn't walk around with a glow and a halo with some neon sign that says, this is my son. He is not a good-looking man. And he's just some carpenter out of Nazareth. There's nothing standing, like no reason for people to say, oh man, if anybody's the Messiah, it's him. You can behold his glory. And this is it. He is a righteous man who cares for other individuals. And he's telling you and he's telling me, care for other individuals. How absurd is that? Care for people. Love your neighbor. Do good to your enemies and pray for them too. Give to people and don't expect that they have to give it in return. These are fantastic living points and somebody says it's absurd. Here you go in Acts 17. He goes into Athens. Now here's, the po here's a big point, y'all, that sometimes we overlook. Acts 17. He goes into Athens and he goes to Mars Hill. And look who he's talking to, the philosophers. I was listening to a prominent, just... If you want to call him a philosopher of today's world, he's just, he is always lecturing on what he thinks to be the best lifestyle. How huge this moment is. Now, he's Jewish, and he said, this is what I think Christianity is. He said, I think that Judaism basically was tired of being so single by itself out here, and he said, Judaism did a merge with Athens philosophy, and you got Christianity. No, that's not true. Why? Because Paul the Christian is trying to change the Athenians. He's not merging with them. Here's my point. When you think of all, I'm saying, great philosophers of our past, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Athens, the thinking capital of the known world at that time frame, and look what's happening. Paul comes in, certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods. Absurdity. If it's not absurd on the front end, it has no hope. These are people who are fine with worshiping idols. And somehow they looked at Paul and said, this is weird. I don't have a problem with that. Why would you let anybody let you make you feel inferior based on your belief system in the Christian system? What are they doing? Well, I'm just inhabiting, I'm just a, a blob of mass, and I'm randomly inhabiting this location of Virginia, and when I die, I'm just going to be dead. Man, what hope. What, what a life. They said, he seems to be one who sets forth strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection, and they took him and brought him unto, the, unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine where, whereof thou speakest is? For thou bring a certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. We bring strange things to a lot of people's ears. 
and they just don't know yet. Y'all, we talked in our Bible class about people who are ignorant. They just don't know any better. These folk, and look at them. They insult him before he even gets going. What's this babbler want to talk about? People are going to insult you. That's not when you say, well, okay then. If that's how things are, I'll just gather up my stuff and go home. You do your job. What's the Christian's job? Tell people about Jesus and eternal life. May we know what this new doctrine thou speak is, for you bring in certain strange things to our ears. We would know there, therefore what these things mean. It's not that strange, like we said. Number one, it's in the Bible. Number two, a lot of these people in the sectarian groups weren't doing this stuff like 60, 70 years ago. We say, women can't preach in the Lord's church. What? Man, y'all weren't doing that 60 years ago. What are you talking about? Y'all, and I'm saying, who? Baptists, y'all, we got uh, Baptist Church in Martins with the first woman preacher. And in all their existence on Starling, they never had a woman preacher until 2020. Y'all gonna tell me it's weird. Y'all been doing it? Y'all went all the way till 2020, didn't have one. No church bands. Do you know what people do? And I don't know, like, it came, that's the name. Kids go to college, and one of the, like, extracurricular things that they do is they get with an a cappella group. And they take current pop songs, take all the music out, and they sing together. Did barbershop quartets really happen in barbershops, or is that just some name that I don't understand? I don't know. But there's plenty of people that would get together, and they just want to sing without musical accompaniment. And we say, we come together and worship God. Ephesians 5, 19, we just sing together. You ain't got no piano? No. No guitar? No drum? No. That's weird. Again, a lot of people weren't doing it up until, like, the early or mid-1800s. It's not that weird. And a lot of their teachers would teach against it, but let's get back on this. He teaches them Jesus and the resurrection. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and they already called it a strange doctrine, and others said, we'll hear thee again of this matter. Now here's the thing, this is where we started. Some people said, I don't know about that. And some people said, we'll hear more of this. If you can't answer it, you can't answer it. But just because it's not what you currently believe doesn't mean anything. And we know that when we talk to sectarian people, we're talking to a Methodist and they say, well, I don't know about immersion. Okay, you may have come up with sprinkling and pouring, but just because you think it's an option and you can't actually prove it, don't say I don't know about that. And we got to be the same way, y'all. If we can't really answer it, we can't just dismiss these people and say I don't know about that. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. And among the which these individ individuals... Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now, here's my point. We like it. We take a little bit of comfort when we find out Albert Einstein says, if it's not absurd on the front end, then it has no hope. Now, we say, oh, Albert Einstein said that. Paul went into situations knowing full well some people are going to mock this. Some people are going to think it's strange. Some people are going to think it's crazy. And they didn't change it for anybody. I'm not going to change the truth for anybody. And here's another thing. I'm not going to start packaging it in such a fashion to where they think, oh, this is close to what we do. Christianity in the New Testament is nothing akin to sectarianism that's going on today. There's no way that I could package it to where they would think, huh, these guys aren't that far away from us. They were started with men way, way after Acts 2. I am not going to start changing the packaging just because some people are going to mock at it. Now, here's where we are. What's it all about? The strangeness. The absurdity. Acts 17 still. Paul says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained. Now, as we look at this text, and it says, Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Y'all, this does not have to be a fear-inducing text. He will judge the world in righteousness. Now, we all know what the standard is. It's the Bible. You and I know that. The religious world doesn't recognize that. The Bible's the standard. 
But as we continue in the New Testament, what's he going to talk about when he says God's going to judge the world in righteousness? It's the, the system of our salvation and the plan of salvation. He's going to judge the world according to the means by which he says, I will save you. It's not this idea of, can you be good enough? In Romans 10, he says, they have not, what? Gone about God's way of righteousness, he says, but they being ignorant had tried to establish their own righteousness, their own plan of salvation. In Romans 3.21, what does he say? He says, the righteousness of God is manifest without the law. What's he saying? God, what does that mean, God's righteousness is manifest without the law? He is saving us outside of your ability to be perfect. By, and how does he get to do that? By that man whom he hath ordained, Jesus the Christ. Here's why Paul is willing to go to a crowd that, number one, insults him. What's this babbler going to say? Number two, they're going to say, this is weird, but we're going to hear you out about it, so go ahead. Why is he willing to do it? Because he wants these people to be saved. You know, we're having a lot of conversation right now, and if you don't know about it, I do not understand why people who don't genuinely want to be in here at 11 o'clock, I don't know why people come who don't want to study. I don't know why, and I'm saying brethren, brothers and sisters, I don't know why some people will attend at 11 o'clock with no intention of making these type of mental notes and saying, I'm going to talk to people about Jesus Christ and His church. I don't get it. And if you're just saying, well, I feel bad if I don't come, that is not a good reason. We need to do some big-time self-examination and do some reevaluating of our priorities and say, what has happened to me that I would just rather stay home and watch Price is Right? 11 o'clock. It might be 10 o'clock when Price is Right comes on. I don't know. But that's why he's willing to go through all this. God winked at their sin. Now let's pause. We're fixing to make a big transition, but let's pause to talk about this. Acts 17, 30 and 31, he says, the times of this ignorance God winked at they could have very well, that word that they put wink, they could have very well just put into our text, overlooked. How are these, and this is a common question, how are those uh, Old Testament people going to be saved without Jesus? They're not going to be saved without Jesus. The question needs to be, how are they going to be saved without knowing about Jesus? They are saved by Jesus just as much as you and I are. But look at what the answer is. Now we're going to throw in a scripture. It's Hebrews 9.15. How are these people going to be saved, Old Testament people going to be saved, without knowing who Jesus was and out, without knowing about the cross and the resurrection? Paul's going to say God overlooked their sins. And this question comes up after that. Can God overlook sins today? And I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of members of the church that are going to say, No. What? You're telling me that there was more grace back there for these people than we get right now? <laughs> that is the whole point of Jesus manifesting himself to us. Yes, in the way that he said, God winked at y'all. What does Romans 4 say? Romans 4, 4 through 7. He is not going to impute those sins. He's not going to remember them. That's Hebrews chapter 10. Now, and he says then in Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ. Now, you tell me what the difference in those terms and overlooking is. Romans 4, 6, and 7, he says, Blessed is the man whose sins are covered. Well, it's not that he's overlooking them. They, you've been covered by the blood, and now he can't see them. Oh, my. <laughs> Overlooked and can't see. Big, big difference. Here's the passages. Hebrews 9, 15. They're not saved without Jesus they just didn't know the full extent, but y'all, they had faith. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. He died for them, just like he died for you and me. But look at Habakkuk 2.4. Did they know about the resurrection? I, they had prophecies. I don't think they knew what that meant. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. These people were saved by their faith just like we are today. Now, here's my thing. Let's make a transition. Paul went through all of that. Why? Because he very, very much believed that these people could be saved. And he wanted them to be saved. Now, here's the difference between us and Paul. 
We believe people can be saved. We don't want everybody to be saved. Y'all, you know, I have had conversations with people. One man told me, he's in the Baptist church, and he said, he said, I knew this guy from our outside lives. And he said, you know, I had just seen about enough of that man in my life. And he said, and so when he came on a particular Sunday, I didn't go to church. That is awful for us to say, you know, if this person is inside the body and we don't want to be around him. But here's the second thing. If we really shouldn't be around him, then let's withdraw from him and stop playing games. Right? Now let's think about this. Here's the other option. I, there's another brother in Christ. Now that man's not a brother. But we have a brother in Christ. And years ago, I was studying with his stepdad. And his stepdad cheated on his biological mother and he knew it. And he pulled me aside one day after worship and we're outside on the sidewalk and he said, Caleb, I know you're having Bible studies with my stepdad. And he said, I appreciate you trying to make an effort. And he said, I'm being honest with you. He said, I got hate for that man. But I know that if he obeys the gospel, I've got to change, not just him. That's the way to be. That's the Christian attitude. We've got to possess that to help these people have the blessing of being saved. Now let's look at this. Y'all, we just had a, I don't know how many minute discussion about the value of John 1, 14. The Word took on flesh. And why? And in Luke 23, he said, Surely this was a righteous man to take away our sin. Acts 17, we went all through that. That by this man, we have our salvation. Now the sectarians will say, Why don't y'all just preach Jesus? Man, we just did. We preached Jesus. Now let me ask a question. Why are y'all ignoring Jesus? You don't put Jesus' name on the sign. You, they would never call themselves the Church of Christ. The sectarian groups, well, you... Man, y'all, Pentecost, saying we're Pentecostals. What? You could just, seriously, the people who just straight up say we're charismatic, that makes more sense because the Greek word is charisma, for gift. But when they say we're Pentecostals, that ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. That is a Jewish feast day. And they say we're Pentecostals. We're Baptists. Well, we believe in full immersion versus sprinkling, but we don't believe that it saves you. Boy, you dedicated your whole name to something you don't believe in? We're Methodist. Based on what? We really like the way that John Wesley did things. So why don't you go ahead and call yourself a Wesleyan like the other crowd does? Well, they had a big fight. Wesley Wesleyans and Methodists did years ago about some people wanted to keep slaves and some people said we need to free slaves. Presbyterians. And we could just go on and on and on. Episcopalians. Lutherans. Now they say to us, why don't you guys preach Jesus? And I say right back to them, how's this moon bounce telling anybody about Jesus? Faith Memorial, down on 58, that was one of the things. Like in the week after Mark and I had been there and they stole my camera when I was 14 years old, when Dad went back, no, they had it the day we went, didn't they? Because that's what we were taping. Had a moon bounce out there, boy, bouncing for Jesus. Isn't this great? Hot dogs, fish fries, church bands, neon lights, smoke machines. Why are they doing it? Hardly any focus on the actual message of Jesus, the Christ, His apostles, and the mission of the book of Acts. They don't have any education going on over there. And you know why that is? Why are they changing the focus? Let's read these texts here. It came out of this book. He says, I believe the preaching in many churches is so poorly done that it is not effectively preaching. The contemporary... He's talking about contemporary. They call themselves emergent church, community churches. He says the contemporaries and the emergents implicitly deny what the... Now, this man's a Presbyterian. He says what the Westminster says about preaching. And so they attempt to achieve the church's end through other means. He recognizes we have made some changing outs here. It's not about preaching anymore. It's about moon bounces. It's about a concert. They're trying to achieve the church's end through other means. I concur with them that the church is failing in many circumstances, but I attribute this not to the churches employing the wrong means, but to the churches employing the right means incompetently. Now let's go down here. My challenge to the contemporaries and the emergence is this. Show me a church where the preaching is good, and yet that church is still more abundant, hopeless, headed towards death. I've never seen such a church. The moribund churches 
have seen, that I've seen have been mal-preached to death. But the fact that large segments of the church are abandoning anything like traditional preaching altogether establishes my point. Now, this is a fictional person, like I always say, Ted. Ted can't preach. He preaches so poorly that even believers have come to disbelieve that God has chosen through the folly of preaching to save those who believe. Now this, someone says, Caleb, you're hard, you're mean, you're unkind, you're confrontational. This was written by a Presbyterian, and he explains in this book why they go to moon bounces and why they go to the concerts, because they know they can't preach anymore. They couldn't change anybody's mind if a million dollars was on the line. We will give you a million dollars if you can change this Presbyterian to a Baptist. They wouldn't be able to do it. They know they can't preach. What do people love the most about these sectarian sermons? Keep it short, Pastor. Why? Because it stinks. That's why. There's no Bible in it. They get up and tell jokes. They get up and just, y'all, they will ramble on. And you know what they're doing? I know what they're doing. I'll tell you why and how I know what they're doing. When I would take piano lessons when I was 15, some weeks I wouldn't practice. So you know what I would do? I'd go in and just talk to Miss Deborah because I didn't want her to know that I hadn't practiced. So I would talk to something to her about that I knew that she'd be interested in and she just would gab with me too. And that way we would be not having a conversation about, Caleb, did you practice? And I wouldn't have to tell her no. That's what the preachers are doing. The sectarian preachers get up and they talk for so long and all they're doing is killing the clock because they know they don't have 30 minutes worth of material. They know they can't preach. They know they can't change any, anybody's mind. So what they're doing is they're trying to hook people in with the festivities and the food. And man, y'all, don't you know? People, someone told dad back in June, they said, I am so sick of having to cook my own lunch and then buy it back from my denomination. They said, pastor said next Sunday we're going to have a potluck. You're cooking the food. And then it's $5 a head. I bought this food, cooked this food, now i got to buy it back. Man, if the people could just have the Bible study, y'all, they would unhook themselves from this so fast. And here's the thing. Y'all, we work and the ladies make meals and it's no big deal. But have you ever considered that this congregation and the Martinsville congregation has been motivated to do two-week tent meetings without any of this nonsense? Why? Because the power of the Word and your motivation to do what God said. Man, aren't you thrilled to be a part of this congregation? I am. I would not want to be in any of these congregations where they do nothing and consistently eat, eat, eat. Man. And that's why I'm saying we pray for each other, we interact with each other, we work with each other, we pray for our brethren in Martinsville. Y'all, we got to be praying for them. We are the workforce, y'all. We are the workforce of this community, and it's all about the Word, and these people know they're not getting it. They know they can't preach. Ezra 7.10, here's the problem. Now let's talk about ourselves now. Y'all, Anything sports related on TV, you watch a dude, if you're watching football and you see him try to kick like a 30-yard field goal and he misses it, and you sit at home and say, how could he miss that? I would have made that. No, you wouldn't. You're watching golf on TV, he misses a big, long putt. Man, I can't believe he didn't sink that. If that had been me, I would have sunk that thing. No, you wouldn't. You're not a professional golfer. We can't knock these preachers and then ourselves not be ready to teach the community. We go out and ask people, did the sermon where you were on Sunday, did it stink? They say, Pfft. I don't even remember what it was about to tell you if it stunk or not. Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel the statutes and the judgments. If I'm not preparing myself, I don't get to come along and tell them they can't preach. That's everybody in this audience. If you're not prepared to start do some teaching, you can't complain. You cannot talk to these people about how bad they got it, and then they say to you, well, what would you have me do? Don't say, come talk to my preacher. You start telling them. Ezra had to prepare himself to do it. Now let's look at this. John 3.10, it's always been this way. This book is really nothing new, right? Why they can't preach? Look what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, how can I be born again when I'm old? I can't enter my mother's womb a second time. And Jesus said, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? 
It's been that way since Jesus' day. It's happening right now. People don't know the Bible. 1 Timothy 3, 2, apt to teach means skilled in teaching. The majority of the elders in the church throughout the brotherhood cannot teach. They couldn't reason themselves out of a wet paper bag. Now what are we going to do? We can't be up here in Danville and saying, well, these folk can't teach and they don't know nothing. And then we just turn into do-nothings ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves to teach people. We, and it's not just enough to know it, y'all. We, be, be, we have to become conversationalists. We have to become persuasive. Let me tell you, telling folk off is not the same thing as teaching lost souls. Now, the Word, as we progress, as we progress through the study, they will probably become uncomfortable. But I'm not looking for ways to just meaninglessly poke them. The Word is going to do the pricking. we got to be skilled, and part of it is being skilled enough to lead them to where they see the conclusions on their own, to where they don't get to say, so are you telling me? No, 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 no. You came up with that based on the Scriptures. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, for when the time that you ought to be teachers, y'all, everybody has this type of responsibility now and i'll say it this way too are we considering are we thinking ahead that's part of the problem for anybody if we don't make plans we're never going to actually implement and start new things y'all all know how i am i'm saying teach the kids what are y'all going to do is there a plan in order do we have a plan in order that if on one sunday i show up with some kids in my car who's going to teach them because I've done that in the past, and when we went out two Sundays ago, I told a little boy, if you want to come to Bible class, you tell your mama to call this number, we'll come get you. And he's only five years old, so who's going to be doing the teaching? We've got to be thinking about these things. I am fine, I'm telling you, fine and dandy. Someone says, well, what are you going to do with a five-year-old? I'm going to put the seed in that five-year-old, and he's going to be in here hearing that there's only one church in the New Testament. He's going to grow up and say, that's not what I've heard. But when he grows up, he's going to actually have something to back it up with. We've got to be thinking about these things. Teaching our neighbors, having conversations with our neighbors, our friends, our family members. Where are we? Y'all got Labor Day coming up? Anybody going to see family on Labor Day? Be talking to them. Talking to them about what they need to hear, the gospel. And this is what we're doing. Why they, why they focus on the, the band and the fish fry. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. You know why, y'all? Man... If somebody came in here, like a, let's say five Baptists came in, they said, we brought our preacher. We want to talk. Y'all got the mic, man. Here you go. 30 minutes. Give it to us. We would do it. Why? We are that confident in the truth. Now, when we go in, what's it like? Hit the road. What you even come down here for? Why? Because they are not rooted in the truth. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. First Corinthians 15. Rooted and built up and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Any teacher could come in here and we give him the floor. As long as we get to have response time. Why? Because the truth is going to do its job. But these man-made religious groups have not done their study and Ephesians 4, which we don't have on the screen, Ephesians 4 says they're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And they can't stand it, y'all, that we're rooted down and they're not. And that's part of, I'm saying, when people succeed in life, how many times do people just say, man, good for them? No, they say, now why didn't that happen to me? And it happens in religion too. They look at us, we're unmovable. And instead of saying, oh, I'd like to be unmovable too, they just hate on us because we're unmovable. And they say, y'all ain't nothing but a bunch of hard-headed folk. That's right! He told, God told Ezekiel, your forehead is going to be, have, to, have to be as hard as flint. Hey, you can reason with me through the truth. But if you start bringing in, my grandfather said, my pastor said, the Westminster Confession says, then yeah, I'm going to be pretty hard-headed with the truth. This is really what we're trying to talk to people about, y'all. Three essentials. Rooted in the truth and unmovable. And they know they can't preach. And y'all, we have a very simple task. Three essentials. Who's the Savior? Well, they all agree on that. 
Right? People in town, they agree with that. Jesus. How to be saved. Where the saved are. John 3, 5 to John 3, 14, you've got three essentials in there. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You go down to verse 14, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, if he is the Son of Man and he's being lifted up, what does that mean? He's our Christ. He's our Savior. What do you have? Baptism, where the saved are, the kingdom, and our Savior, the Son of Man. Now, that's John 3, 5 through 14. Acts 8, 12. And when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Three essential things that we have to sell the community on. They already believe in one, and it's very, very easy to get them to see the next two, whether they will agree with it and accept it or not, but it's very easy to get them to see it. And that's Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. There's one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Man, you could go out. We're going out today. You could talk to anybody with this. Three essentials. Can I talk to you about three essentials? And they're going to... And here's the thing. Here's what gets in their way. Man, how awful. They can't take the three, these three essentials in Ephesians 4 and, 4 and 5. I hear you. I hear about these three essentials. Y'all got a church band down there? You are out of your mind if you're going to reject these principles because of a piano. You can play as much piano at home as you want. Why do you need it in worship to God? Y'all teaching born and sin down there? That is one of the most awful doctrines. That, and nobody's honest with it. Somebody has a baby, what do you do? Let's give them a baby shower. Why don't y'all change y'all's name for baby shower to a little devil shower? We're going to give them a little devil shower. What are you going to give them? Belt. You're going to need it. Why? Is he just a little devil? No. They say, oh, good for you, little angel. It, they say, uh, childbirth is a miracle. It's not. Is natural. But everybody says, oh, it's a miracle. Hmm, some miracle. God just gave me a little devil. See, people say that, they don't believe it, and they let that one little thing, that little horrible doctrine, stand in the way of these three essentials. One body, one Savior, one plan of salvation. Y'all, and they can't put it out there, and here's the sad part as we look at this. They're not going to be saved. They're not going to be saved rejecting Jesus' plan of salvation and denying the bride of Christ. But here's another thing. Man, you hear people say about somebody, they're growing up and they're making a lot of bad decisions and some grown-up says to them, you ain't going to amount to much. Man. That's, that's, you could say worse things, but that hurts. You ain't going to amount to much. And that's the sad thing about the sectarian groups. They will never amount to anything. And this is what I'm saying again. To the credit of this congregation and the credit to the Martinsville congregation, y'all, the state of Virginia was shut down, and y'all had a two-week tent meeting. Do you think about that? People who drove down 86 and had to think to themselves, I can't even get into my favorite restaurant and these folk out here having a tent meeting. I can't even travel across state lines without having to come back and then jam something up my nose and these people up here having a tent meeting. They saw you. And they saw what it was about. It was about the faith of Christ. Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now here's the thing. Do you catalog? Let's say this. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Someone says, Y'all ain't moving no mountains. Fine. Can we move some hills? Can you give me something? Can you catalog the victories that we have? And I'm going to say just right now, Man, so good. And some, I'm saying, you've got something. This is just what I'm thinking of right now. Y'all, not only did we get to do this when everybody else was doing nothing, Jackie's grandson was right up in there saying, these type of people are doing it, even though the government said, what, 10 people or less? And we're packing people under the tent. Can't, social distancing, what are we doing? Having lunch together. Social distancing, what are we doing? talking to strangers on the doorstep, and he got to see all of that. Now, if Stephen can be a part of the tent meeting, then surely Jackie can come to Bible class, no problem, right? See, we get these victories all around us. Why? Because we keep the Word, which has the power, we keep the Word in us, the seed, and we're 
moving hills, we're moving mounds, we're moving mountains. And these people in the community are going to live a life where they are not going to do anything with the Word of God. Man, y'all. Do you... No, I know that you do. You hope that the casino doesn't get to come in here. Y'all, what is going to happen if that casino doesn't come in here and we're going to be the only religious group that was vocal against it? Everybody in town will recognize. And they, they won't be shocked. They're used to it. The Church of Christ did that. And it wasn't their sectarian group. The Church of Christ did that. They will never move mountains. They will never enjoy the amount of fellowship that we do, y'all. That stuff that they do is fake. I, you know, when you're in like a mega church and y'all are having a fish fry together, you just went to a restaurant. Do you feel like you have fellowship when you go to Pizza Hut? <laughs> oh, y'all in there eating pizza at the same time? What fellowship? That's going to eat a fish fry at a mega church. You ain't got no fellowship with those people. Romans 1, 15 through 16. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This morning, you recognize the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel has worked on your heart. You have obeyed the gospel. You're a part of the body of Christ. And now here we are collectively saying it's powerful. And it is powerful, even when people don't obey it. Why? Because like we said, it can make or break their day, and it breaks a lot of days. Well, that ain't what my pastor said. Man, they're wrestling. I hope that you full well have a recognition of who you are. A child of God, a member of the body of Christ in Matthew 17, you, with the power of the truth, have the possibility to move these hills, these mounds, and these mountains. And we're doing it together. If you've been discouraged and you've been saying, like, I would hope that nobody say, I don't know if I'm in the right church at this point. Where else are you getting this type of activity? Where else do you get this type of fellowship? Where else do you get this type of material? Bible, straight Bible. And we don't talk about confessions, creed books, or manuals. I hope you know who you are and where you are. Child of God in the body of Christ. And we got a collected mission. Are we still doing it? Full-heartedly are we still doing it? You know, we always have to step back and do some reevaluation. If you've got to do some reevaluation, do it. Don't leave the rest of us hanging while we're still working. Let's think about all this as we stand and sing this song together.